Welcome, my name is Maggie Warner. I'm the Director of Liturgy and Music here at St. Ignatius Church. And I'm so excited to have all of us here in our magnificent space and welcome to everyone that is joining us online. This is our second session of this fall's Adult Faith Formation Series, Encountering Vatican II. This week marked the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council when at 8.30 in the morning on October 11th, 1962, 2,500 council fathers processed into St. Peter's and began the work of birthing a movement that calls us now more than ever to be a church that is, in the words of the late John O'Malley, a beacon, catalyst, and matrix of unity for the whole human race. So it is on this auspicious anniversary that we discuss tonight the first constitution promulgated by the Council, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. And we welcome into our community scholar, teacher, and author, Rita Ferrone, to encourage us to live into the call of the Second Vatican Council. Rita is an award-winning writer and frequent speaker on issues of liturgy and church renewal in the Roman Catholic tradition. She is a recognized leader in the area of adult Christian initiation and has played a vital role in liturgical renewal across the U.S. through her writing, teaching, consulting, and leadership training seminars. She is the author of several books about liturgy, including an acclaimed commentary on the liturgy constitution of the Second Vatican Council, Liturgy, by Paulist Press. Her articles have been translated into eight languages, and she is currently a contributing writer and columnist for Commonweal Magazine. On a personal note, I first encountered Rita at a National Pastoral Musicians Conference in 2013, where she was the keynote speaker and brought down the house. I was inspired to see a woman reimagining ways for all of the baptized to create and participate in the liturgy, which is the work of the people. Rita Ferrone is a pioneering woman in her field. She began teaching and working in the area of liturgical theology and study before positions for liturgists were commonplace and has made a pathway for lay people and women in a field that was for centuries closed off. Please join me in welcoming Rita Ferrone. Thank you so much, Maggie, and thank you all for this warm welcome. For this East Coast person, it's such a pleasure to be in San Francisco, and I hope that we'll have a good evening tonight. If any of you are visual learners, th there will be some texts up there, but rest assured, we are going to, s I'll say everything that appears on the screen, so if the print is too small, don't worry, you'll hear it, and if you're really desperate to get exactly what the words were, it'll be on the recording that you can access at any time after this is over. At the time of the 50th anniversary of the Council, the Second Vatican Council, Canadian theologian Gilles Routier observed that, with respect to the Council, we are entering into a period where we are now in the role of heirs, heirs to the Second Vatican Council, inheriting a legacy that we did not invent or produce for ourselves. Now, some of you here have a living memory of the Council, but there are now more people who don't have, more Catholics who don't have a living memory of the Council than there are who do and it introduces us into a new situation. And this is even more true today, now that we've passed the 60th anniversary. And this gives us some new challenges with respect to what the Council did. Routier noted that being an heir might look easy. We didn't have to do the work. But actually, it's not so simple. Because there are many different responses to a legacy. You know this in your own lives, I think. We can fritter it away. 
we can turn our back on it. We can try to preserve it unchanged to the letter. We can quarrel with our siblings over it and cut it into pieces. Or we can become good stewards of the legacy we've received, making it grow and bear fruit. In Matthew's parable of the talents, the good servant is the one who multiplies what he's been given. The good servant is given praise for what he's done and will be entrusted with even more. That's the faithful response. But we've all seen that each of these responses has played out in the post-conciliar era, haven't we? We've had plenty of quarreling among our siblings over what is the legacy of the council. We've seen efforts to focus on the letter of the documents to preserve the conciliar legacy intact, but go no further. We know folks who have turned their back on the conciliar church and some who have simply frittered the legacy away. But we're here tonight, however, to enter into that fifth alternative. And in order to do that, we need to understand the reform as a continuing life-giving project. One that we can enter into today in various ways, bringing our creative energy to it as a thing which lives and therefore is always new. And it lives because Christ lives within it. That's, that's the core of what my approach to this is going to be tonight. This is precisely where Pope Francis comes into the picture. He has emerged as a leading figure, affirming the work of the council and taking it another step further. The movement towards synodality, for example, is a continuation of the Council's in insight. Opening the instituted ministries of lector and acolyte to women, as Francis has done, is another continuation of the Council's momentum. Creating a new instituted ministry, the ministry of catechist, is a third way that Pope Francis has continued the work of the Second Vatican Council. And he has blessed the creation of an Amazonian rite in South America for the tribes of the Amazon region. It hasn't been finished yet, but they're working on it. And it is going to be a thing. These decisions have all continued the life of Vatican II, which had, prior to this time, slowed down, or sometimes one feels it is even reversed course during the John Paul and Benedict years. Maybe that's some of the frittering away kind of phenomenon that we've, we've noticed. I'm here to speak to you tonight about the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. The Vatican do document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, has been monumental in the history of the Catholic Church. I don't think that's too strong a term to use. It's been monumental in our history. Now, some would contend that the reform of the liturgy went wrong, it was done wrong, or that its energy is spent and it's bankrupt. It's over. That's not Francis's view at all, and it's certainly not mine. <laughs> I wouldn't be here tonight if it were. <laughs> But I recognize that some uh, who are listening to this talk tonight may come to the subject of liturgy with questions and uneasiness about the reform. And the question for all of us rises again, where do we go from here? What shall we do with the legacy that we have received? What shall we do with what we've inherited? In 2021, Pope Francis made a hard decision. After consulting with the bishops of the world, he wrote a motu proprio addressed to them called Traditionis Custodes, Guardians of the Tradition. 
In it, he set strict limits upon the use of the rites that predated the Second Vatican Council, sometimes called the extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary form or the Tridentine rites or traditional Latin mass or whatever you want to call it, the rites that predated Vatican II and its reform of the liturgy. And Pope Francis rolled back the broad permission that Pope Benedict had given for these rites to be used, which he issued in 2007. Now, Francis has always been quite tolerant of a limited use of the older rites as a pastoral concession, but he discovered that an open-ended use of these older rites was deepening divisions in the church, and in fact, creating a church within the church, calling us back to focus in one place, the Reformed liturgy, was an important decision, therefore. It removed the illusion that the liturgical reform that flowed from the council could be canceled, or that it was just another menu option. You get to pick. You know, in our age of consumer choice, that seemed like an okay thing. Some people like the old stuff, some people like the new stuff, let everybody be happy. That's not really liturgical tradition as it is understood in the, the theology of the church. What Francis was doing is returning to an idea of tradition that is when you reform something, that means you then move into what has been reformed and you don't keep looking back. So uh, this was to restore unity uh, some of you may even know uh, that the new liturgy was called by some of the advocates for the traditional Latin mass, irreverent and heretical. Uh, so this was to stop that from happening and to have a sense that we can gather at a single altar. So in response to this divisiveness, he was pointing again to the fact that this is an ecclesiological question, not an aesthetic question, not a question of liturgical tastes or preferences, but a question of what is the church. Okay. So as a result of Traditionis Custodes, there are no longer two forms of the Roman rite, as Pope Benedict had termed the ordinary form and the extraordinary, uh, extraordinary form. There is but one Roman rite, and it's the one that was reformed at Vatican II. Handing this liturgy on as a living legacy, as the lex orandi, the law of prayer, is now quite clearly the responsibility, as the Pope has articulated it, to the bishops that as bearers of the tradition, this is what carries the tradition, the reformed liturgy. This was the core message of Traditionis Custodes. So that was part one. And it was a disciplinary teaching, very short little document. Francis's apostolic letter this year, on the other hand, is part two. The, t the name of it is Desiderio Desideravi. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but by the time my talk ends, you will have heard it so many times that you'll know how to pronounce it. So it's, it means earnest desire. Desiderio Desideravi. Why don't you say that with me? This will be good. Desiderio Desideravi. You got it? Well, okay. Anyway, okay, whatever. It's a letter on the subject of liturgical formation. It was released on the, the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, which was no accident. You know, Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter, whose heir uh, the Pope is. You know, so the unity of the church resting with Peter and the See of Rome. So it was addressed not just to the bishops, or even to bishops and priests, but to the whole people of God. So everybody in this room, that letter was addressed to you, and if you haven't read it yet, it's up on your website at the parish, so it's there and you can find it pretty easily, and it's, a, it's really rich. So uh, the two messages together are about passing on the liturgical legacy of Vatican II as a living tradition something that increases in abundance as we live in it joyfully in real time. 
recall the role of the good servant who brings back to his master what was entrusted with interest. That's what I believe Pope Francis wants to happen with Vatican II. And we have a part to play in that. We can do that with him if we're willing to join in this effort. We are all called to be good stewards of our liturgical tradition. In the promotional materials for this talk, I observed that Francis's letter is a lot like a retreat. His grounding in Ignatian spirituality is evident in the letter. He wants to help us enter into a prayerful experience of encounter with the risen Christ through the liturgy, an experience that will lift burdens from us and open our hearts to grace, preparing us to freely discern where God is calling us to go next. I know this is a Jesuit parish and many of you are members of the parish. I just want to know if any of you here have been on an Ignatian retreat or you've done the exercises, some part of the exercises, raise your, oh, okay. So you know what I'm talking about with Ignatian spirituality and those who don't uh, will we'll, uh, cue you in as it goes along. Toward this end, Francis offers not a treatise or the answers to all questions, but rather what he calls prompts and cues for reflections on the liturgy. We will take Pope Francis up on some of these prompts and cues tonight in order to deepen our appreciation of the living legacy of the Council. Here's a quick review, though, before we do that, I think to begin, a quick retrospective about how the Council on Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council has already changed the way we worship. Here are some fun facts about the document. <laughs> I would not have you leave a talk about Sacrosanctum Concilium without at least hearing a quick review of some of these things. I'm just going to tick them off and listen to them. It was the first of the four major constitutions uh, produced by the Council. The reform it produced has been regarded as the sign and symbol of the whole work of the Council ever since. It called for a thoroughgoing reform of the liturgy, including all the sacraments and the liturgy of the hours, the full conscious and active participation of the people was the goal to be pursued in this reform above all else. One of the commentators on the uh, Constitution in the early days said, full conscious active participation appeared so often in the document it was like the response to the litanies. Pray for us, pray for us, full conscious active participation, full conscious active participation. It directed that the lectionary should be reformed and expanded so that the faithful would have, quote, richer fare at the table of God's word. You can have a, a, a thing in this series on Dei Verbum, the doc document that was on scripture. All these documents are interrelated and the lectionary reform is part of how this relates to our new awareness of the power and meaning of engagement with the word and the, the word of scripture. And I, I can't stop and comment on this. I gotta go through this fast, so pardon me. I get distracted because I love this stuff and I wanna tell you more stuff. Okay. It restored the prayer of the faithful. It gave permission for the laity to receive communion under both forms. Who knew that COVID would revoke that permission? <laughs> No, it, communion under both forms was, was then possible to be used. It allowed for the mother tongue, contemporary languages, to be used more frequently in the liturgy. It gave permission, uh, it gave regional conferences of bishops a role in shaping the liturgy for their regions, significantly by approving vernacular translations for liturgical texts. It invited enculturation welcoming the diverse peoples of the globe to incorporate their culture and customs and traditions into the liturgy as long as those customs and traditions are in harmony with the gospel. It opened the door to new musical instruments and called for a renewal of art and architecture. It prized what it called noble simplicity and condemned what it called sumptuous display. Oh my. 
Oops. Okay. No, this is this is what they some people would call noble simplicity. We, we don't have cherubs hanging all over. Okay. Uh, uh, where are we here? Okay. Uh, um, it called for the restoration of the catechumenate, and it raised the importance of baptism in the church. It legitimated lay ministries in the liturgy as ministries in their own right and not delegations of the function of the priest, as it used to be thought before. The priest did everything, and he could delegate something to someone else. No, these are proper roles that the, the lay people can undertake. It called for the restoration of the permanent diaconate. The opening section of the Constitution, situating the liturgical question within the life of the church, was the work of a subgroup that was added last, after all the other subgroups had been formed. And this section became first and most important. So the last became first in the writing of the text. The discussion around Sacrosanctum Concilium on the council floor was long and animated. There were 50 hours of debate, 387 oral interventions, and 297 interventions submitted in writing. I've read some of the documents of, about that. They're all recorded, all these interventions. And there were even times when the chairman would have to cut somebody off and say, OK, enough, stop it. And there was one council father who was so enraged that he was, he was cut off because he said, you know, father, you, you, it's enough. That he, he was just outraged, at, but the people on the floor applauded. <laughs> They applauded that stuff. It was a very contentious little uh, conversation. But the final approval on December 4th, 1963, was overwhelming. 2,147 fathers voting in favor and four against. Four against. Pope Francis very wisely does not start out his apostolic letter on liturgical formation by pawing through the box of all the things that the Sacrosanctum Concilium did, as important as these are. Rather, he begins by unearthing truths of the gospel that underlie them all. So tonight, we're going to look at five of his prompts. There are more, but we're just going to look at five of them. The desire of Jesus the call to mission and evangelization, the role of creation in the liturgy, the question of who celebrates, and finally, the theme of the Paschal mystery. So, the desire of Jesus. Pope Francis begins with the desire of Jesus. He calls our attention to a tiny gospel text, the words of Jesus in Luke. I have desired with an earnest desire, desiderio desideravi, I have desired with an earnest desire to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. So Jesus is on the verge of giving his life for us on the cross. Francis makes a great point of this. All of salvation history, all of human history, has been leading up to this moment when the self-gift of Jesus will be given to God. And what does Jesus want to do most of all? He wants to eat this meal with them. Sometimes I think Jesus must have been Italian. <laughs> Eating the meal was his earnest desire, I know. Other cultures also love eating meals. But it's not just any meal, it is the Passover meal. The meal that celebrates God's redemption and the formation of a people. So he wants to eat the Passover meal with us, with us. By starting with the desire of Jesus, Pope Francis is showing us that the Eucharist, the sign of our redemption, is a mystery of divine love. He calls this text from Luke's Gospel the crevice through which we glimpse the depths of the love of the Holy Trinity for us. 
the crevice or crack, spiraglio in Italian, can also mean a skylight, an opening that lets in the light. He explains that Jesus desired to eat with those present, but by extension, he desires the same thing for all of us. Now, I don't think anyone automatically thinks, you know, I'm going to Mass because Jesus wants to share this supper with me. Yet, that's exactly what the Holy Father is inviting us to contemplate with our prayerful imagination. Could this possibly be true? I've been thinking a lot about this. And I have to say that meditating on the earnest desire of Jesus to eat the Passover with me has changed the way I go to Sunday Mass. Just since July, I think about this now before I go to the Eucharist. It has become less my choice to go to Mass and more my response to an invitation. It has made me more aware of the other who waits for me. Francis says of the first disciples, for the gift to be given, there has to be someone to receive the gift. The apostles were the first to receive this gift of Jesus, but the invitation to share this meal is extended forward to ourselves. And not only to us, but also to those who come after us, who will hear the good news and share in this banquet for years to come. So here, how might it affect our active conscious participation in the liturgy if we could understand and believe that the liturgy truly is an invitation from the heart of Jesus to share in this meal with him? that our personal presence is something he desires, that the liturgy is in fact a meeting of his heart with ours. I invite you in the days to come to consider this prompt and cue from Pope Francis. See if it doesn't change the landscape of your imagination a little bit and engage your heart in a new way as we celebrate the liturgy. Okay, second, having pinpointed this very personal connection, Pope Francis then takes the theme of encounter one step further. This provides our second cue for reflection. He says, we cannot rest until the whole world has been invited. Here is what Francis calls the missionary option that he dreams of for the church. It's the dream that we might all carry that invitation to those who have not truly received it before. And that doesn't mean they may never have heard of who Jesus is, but they've never heard the invitation. They've never received the call to them. It's a call to somebody else, maybe, but having received it is something else. So what does this have to do with Vatican II and the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. It's a little discussed theme of Sacrosanctum Concilium. Many Catholics, truth to tell, believe that the Council sought to reform the liturgy in order to change the liturgy. But that's not the goal. The reform of the liturgy was undertaken in order to change us to enable us as individuals and as a community, to empower us as people of faith to welcome God's kingdom in ever widening circles. Right from the start of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, that famous first section that was the last one that got added and became first, it says, why reform the liturgy? The Constitution tells us exactly why because the liturgy, and especially the Eucharist, and I quote, is the outstanding means whereby the faithful may express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true church. Let that sink in for a minute. The Constitution tells us 
that the liturgy builds us up, yet also, quote, marvelously strengthens our, again, this exact quote, our power to preach Christ. That's the end toward which the reform is oriented. <clears throat> and when you see it that way, you realize we still have a ways to go. You know, it wasn't about moving the furniture. It was about changing us. So how does the liturgy help us to preach Christ and display the nature of the church? First, through our hearing of the word of God, now more abundantly available in the liturgy, proclaimed since the council in a language we can understand rather than an ancient language that very few people could understand, accompanied by preaching, which in the old church was not necessarily uh, happening, but it was required to preach uh, much more frequently after the council. It set that as the standard. So the word of God. And second, through our active participation in the rites themselves. I don't know if, if everybody thinks of it this, this way, but I believe that's part of the symbolic content of the rite. Walking in procession, joining in song and in silence, breaking the bread, sharing the sign of peace, celebrating the rites of Christian initiation, the rites of healing, and the rites of commitment, and more. These are icons of who we are as God's people. They form us and help us to define what it is we share with the world. We are people on a journey, sustained by faith, exchanging Christ's peace with one another, welcoming, supporting, and celebrating God's reign as it breaks into our world, even in moments of pain and suffering and transition, but always with joy and always with our eye on the ultimate goal of union with God. How shall we bear witness to this, the real nature of the true church? I think this is a fertile question, and we must always ask ourselves, about as bearers of the precious legacy of Vatican II, how are we bearing witness to the nature, true nature, of the real nature of the true church? Pope Francis himself gives us some clues. He takes a page right out of the playbook of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius when he calls for us to imaginatively identify ourselves with the figures we meet in sacred scripture. He writes, and I quote, I am Nicodemus the Samaritan woman at the well, the man possessed by demons at Capernaum, the paralytic in the house of Peter, the sinful woman pardoned, the woman afflicted by hemorrhages, the daughter of Jairus, the blind man of Jericho, Zacchaeus, Lazarus, the thief and Peter both pardoned. I loved that passage. <laughs> You can you tell? Yeah. Uh, though, to be honest, I don't know that we're really doing that or not doing it as much as we can to put ourselves into the roles of those first witnesses to Jesus' ministry and imagine ourselves as them so that we hear and sense the presence of Christ interacting with us through those stories. Uh, let me speak to, for a moment to the catechists in the room. Do we have any catechists in the room? Some people who do catechetical ministry, okay. Well, not enough catechists in the room. I hope they're in the live stream. <laughs> I gave, gave her, Lisa, a little pitch there. <laughs> Maybe you in the live stream are called to be catechists. <laughs> But you're all probably, those of you who are, are probably familiar with the expression, finding our story in the great story of God's love. This is critical for liturgical formation, finding our story in the great story of scripture. Here's another clue, and this one is from the Constitution. The way in which the liturgical reforms of Vatican II fostered the church's ability to preach Christ is also through enculturation. We may not regard enculturation as vital to the liturgy in North America, although some people do. But the fastest growing churches in the world are in Africa, and they are using enculturation to great effect. So I'd like to share with you an intervention from 
at, at the Synod on the Eucharist in 2005 from the Nigerian Cardinal John Olurun Femi Onayakan, who was then president of the Episcopal Conference of Africa and Madagascar. And he said this, my intervention is a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God for the great blessings the Church of Africa has enjoyed in the post-Vatican II era through the active, conscious, fruitful, and indeed also joyous participation in the Eucharist celebrated in the richness of our cultural expressions. The Eucharist deserves and is receiving the best of our cultures. We may not have much to offer in terms of the glorious architecture of European cathedrals or the fabulous paintings of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. But what we have, we are happy to give. Our songs and our lyrics, our drumming and our rhythmic body movements, all to the glory of God. We do well to acknowledge and extol the valuable heritage of the Eucharistic traditions of the different ancient rites, both the East and the West. I believe these are themselves products of an enculturation that took place many centuries ago under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That same spirit has not gone to sleep. So, what about us? Are we being good stewards of the legacy of Vatican II by keeping an outward-directed focus? Do we welcome the best of our human cultures to enrich our common worship? Have we helped one another to read the signs and symbols of the liturgy when they speak of social transformation and of mission? Our third prompt is about the sacraments and creation. One of Pope Francis's cues for reflection concerns a subject very near and dear to his heart indeed, which is uh, that which was explored in his encyclical Laudato Si, the connection between creation and the incarnation. To tell the truth, in Laudato Si, he doesn't talk very much about liturgy, but in Desiderio Desideravi, Francis brings the two subjects together, writing that the whole of creation is placed at the service of the encounter with the incarnate word in the liturgy. And here's a quote that I think is very rich and very true. The liturgy is done with things that are the exact opposite of spiritual abstractions. Bread, wine, oil, water, fragrances, fire, ashes, rock, fabrics, color, body, words, sounds, silences, gestures, space, movement, action, order, time, light. The whole of creation is a manifestation of the love of God." End of quote. The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy does not explicitly take up the theme of creation, but it did change the art of celebration in ways that opened the door to greater richness in our sacramental signs arising from the created world. And this is based on a very old Thomistic principles, St. Thomas Aquinas, grace builds on nature. And one that, uh, another Thomistic principle that the fathers of the council were well aware of was that the sacraments work through our senses. They work through our senses. God engages us in an incarnational way through the sacramental economy of the church. We should bear in mind that the liturgical style of the period immediately before the council was plagued with what my mentor in liturgical studies, Benedictine Father Aidan Cavanaugh, called sacramental minimalism. So you had people baptizing with a teacup of water. You had communion only under one form for the laity. 
you had a minimum of oil being used for anointing. You know, the sacred cotton ball? It, it, Bishop could, could con confirm a hundred confirmants with one cotton ball. You know, it was amazing, right? <laughs> one had to marvel at so much <laughs> that could be done with so little. And that's what Ka Kavanaugh very tartly observed, is that there was a certain boastfulness about, how, look how much we can do with so little. But thankfully, the council intervened and turned the tide on that. So to give an example, when the council permitted communion from the chalice to be shared with the laity, that doubled the material signs of the Eucharist that people were engaging with, for those who engaged with it. And it became, as a result, a richer experience through the senses, sight, touch, sense, taste, smell, all of those things. Now, you know, people will very sternly say, Christ is fully present on e under each form, each form. Well, it's true, and that's information. But information is not inspiration. And our senses give us a richer fare. Why not have more? Why not allow creation to speak in multiple ways? if we can do it within the traditions of our sacramental life. So, uh, oh, here's another example. This is a great one. The right of Christian, initiation, the right of Christian initiation of adults actually advised that baptism by immersion was the preferable means of baptizing adults. And in that, we're seeing a movement toward symbols. A lot of water, a lot of oil, a full baptismal garment, not a little one. These things matter. And this has been a trajectory of the reform ever since to, quote, let the symbols speak. By doing so, we invite the gifts of creation to be the speakers of the mystery of faith in our liturgy. We still have a ways to go. I've seen an Easter fire built out of two sticks in a lasagna pan. <laughs> but I've also seen glorious bonfires at the Easter vigil. And what a glorious difference that makes. Whenever I come to the West Coast, I must say, by the way, I'm always impressed by the natural beauty of your part of the world that surrounds you. The mountains and rivers, the magnificence of the ocean. When Pope Francis speaks about oceans of grace, I think you have a rich landscape that rises to the eye of the mind. What a gift that is. So here's the question. How might our liturgical life engage more intentionally with the grandeur and nearness of God expressed in creation? I don't know that there's just one answer to that, but it is a horizon to explore together as a church. And this could very well be an enriching horizon for the continuing experience of what the Second Vatican Council opened the door to, a sense of creation, a sense of the sacred symbols speaking. Okay, fourth one, who celebrates the liturgy? Now, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy says very clearly that the liturgy is the action of Christ and of his body, the church straight out of Pius XII's, his encyclical on the liturgy. This is not a surprise. The mystical body of Christ and the constitution on the litur sacred liturgy, Vatican II, brought it up again. Yes, the whole mystical body of Christ is the agent. That's who celebrates the liturgy. Yet this insight is persistently overlooked, I think. The mistake is made, and this is a very common mistake among the Catholic faithful, and some of our ordained also, as regarding the liturgy as something done by the priest alone, you know, or by the clergy on behalf of the faithful. For many, this is the default assumption. The priest says mass with the assistance of ministers, perhaps, but the faithful are more or less perceived as an audience. You know what I'm talking about. That idea is still sort of rolling around in our imaginations, you know, that we're here to watch, to listen, and they're there. 
I'm, I don't mean the sacred trinity. I, I don't mean... <laughs> I mean the people who sanctuary are there to be doing the action. Therefore, it's a dormant potential. The Sacrosanctum Concilium urged the faithful to offer their lives along with the sacrifice of Christ on the altar. It, it said that exactly. We should offer our lives with the sacrifice at the Eucharist. Yet even 60 years after that exhortation, I find that we are not really feeling it that way. And I think it's an implicit clericalism that does work its way into our, our sense of what's going on and that perhaps by being aware of it, we can start to imagine a bigger picture and something more profound of an invitation to us to do the offering with the priest, which is what the council wanted us to do. Therefore, it's a thought-provoking and welcome prompt from Pope Francis when he leans on the question of agency. Who does the liturgy? Francis answers that question unambiguously. Quote, the subject acting in the liturgy is always and only Christ hyphen church, the mystical body of Christ. Later on in the letter, Francis reiterates and emphasizes the point even more strongly, saying, let us always remember that it is the church, the body of Christ, that is the celebrating subject and not just the priest. Now Francis values the priesthood. It's by no means a hit on the priesthood. This is essential, it's important. The priest is in a huge role in the liturgy, but it's the whole, okay, so what does this mean? Does it mean that the people in the pews ought to be reciting the Eucharistic prayer sotto voce along with the priest? No, of course not. There are different roles in the liturgy. These differences are admirably laid out in the rubrics, which now include what the assembly does. I don't know if you're aware of this, but this, the, the missile before Vatican II did not have rubrics for the people. It only had rubrics for the priests. And those were only written in because of the liturgical reform. We got on the radar scope at Vatican II in the actual liturgical books. The differences are, are laid out and, you know, to use a hoary comparison, it's like an orchestra. Each of us must do what is our own part in this collective activity. The violinists do not have to play the tuba. Okay. We need to do whatever is our part in the liturgy and only that part in the liturgy. And all together though, we become one orchestra. We become one body of Christ. The mystical body is one. And it says, Paul explained long ago, the hand cannot say to the eye, I do not need you. So no one is unimportant. No one can be done without, not you, nor I, nor the person who sits in the very last seat of the final pew and leaves before the closing blessing. As a result of the historical process, this has been obscured. I mean, let's face it, we, we are uh, creatures of history. Yet it is a wider mandate that the council opened up. I think we might do well to look again at Sacrosanctum Concilium and ask ourselves, do we offer ourselves along with the sacrifice of Jesus at Mass? Do we place our lives on the altar along with the bread and wine? I once had a pastor who was very much influenced by the liturgical, early liturgical movement of the Second Vatican Council. And he used to do something really interesting. He would incense, use incense for the incensing of the altar and the gifts and the people. And that he added this little addition in text, and he would say this. In ancient Israel, incense was used to consecrate an offering to God. And so it is that we incense the altar, the bread and wine, and us. Pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. 
And the people responded, may the Lord receive the sacrifice from your hands to the praise and glory of his name. I still get goose flesh thinking about that, you know, because he made it so clear. It drove the point home. I'm not saying we need to add words to the liturgy in order to do this. There are other ways of doing this. But we do need to understand this dynamic. And you know, it's kind of scary because it means uh, we're willing to embrace the cross ourselves. As the poet and peace activist Dan Berrigan once said, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you'd better look good on wood. So we have to be willing to be part of that sacrifice that is offered to God, but also if we die with him, we will be raised with him. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. So it's an invitation to join him in his glory. So uh, the last, this leads us to our final point, the Paschal Mystery. Pope Francis calls attention to a central mystery of the Constitution on, that the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy spoke of, namely the preeminent mystery that we celebrate in the liturgy is the Paschal Mystery. A lot of people don't know what the Paschal Mystery is. It's the Easter Mystery, the death, resurrection, and glorification of Jesus. It doesn't leave the cross out, but it's part of a whole mystery which embraces the resurrection and the glory and glorification of Jesus. The Paschal Mystery, or Pascha, is the passing over of Jesus from death to life, from suffering to glory, and our passing over with him from sin to a life of grace. The centrality of the Paschal Mystery is the theological linchpin of the entire liturgical reform of Vatican II. And you'll be surprised, perhaps, that that's not my own idea. <laughs> I am quoting from Cardinal Ratzinger. Joseph Ratzinger said this about the liturgical reform. And it's one of the points that is disputed by the traditionalists. They reject that. They say, no, it's about the expiation of sin through the cross the resurrection is not involved. This is one of the contested points, which is why we needed to move it away from traditionalism into this because Paschal Mystery really was uh, recovered at the council and it's a truth of the faith that we need, I think, as our liturgical life is helped by that. At Vatican II, we moved away from the mass as expiation to a mass that celebrates the presence of the risen Christ, who is alive and shares his life with us. This is not an abstraction, even though the language of mystery may seem a little mysterious to some. No, to celebrate the Paschal mystery is to experience Christ walking with us. The risen one meets us on the road of our life, just as he did the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Right in the midst of our disappointed hopes and our distress, he joins us as we walk our journey. And the encounter will not leave us disappointed because now as then, he opens the scriptures to us and he breaks the bread. And we recognize him in this and we know he is alive. Here is how Francis puts it, direct quote. If the resurrection were for us an idea, a concept, a thought, if the resurrection were for us the recollection of the recollection of others, however authoritative, as for example the apostles, if there were not given to us the possibility of a true encounter with him, that would be to declare the newness of the word made flesh to be all used up. Christian faith is either an encounter with him alive or it does not exist. The liturgy guarantees us the possibility of such an encounter. For us, a vague memory of the Last Supper would do no good. We need to be present at that supper to be able to hear his voice, to eat his body and drink his blood. We need him. In the Eucharist and in all the sacraments, we are guaranteed the possibility of encountering the Lord Jesus and of having his, the power of his Paschal mystery reach us. 
The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy makes reference to the Paschal Mystery often, as do our church documents ever since that time, and papal teachings following the Council. It's integrated very strongly into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. For some reason, the American bishops don't mention it in their document on the Eucharist, except one time. I don't know what that's about. Maybe someone can enlighten me at coffee hour after with this, but... but Anyway, Pope Francis employs the language of Paschal Mystery 11 times in his letter. Though the English translation is a bit weird, rendering some instances of what it says in the original as the Pascha, which is a perfectly good theological term, meaning the Passover of the Lord, the Pascha, as his Paschal deed, which I don't think I've ever heard anywhere in English before, his Paschal deed. So we have a few, but that's a translation issue. It's not uh, anything about substance. Okay, the Paschal mystery was a central theme in the reform and it enjoys prominence in Francis's letter, but what does it matter? There are certain implications of this that I think we need to unpack. Having embarked, now I, I'm going to turn now to current experience, very recent experiences. Having embarked on the synodal process, I know this parish has done so, and my worshiping community did, did so, and other places have done so in some, in some ways. Having embarked on the synod process, we all know that our journey as a church has been a story of light and shadows. There is much that we remember with gratefulness and hold as treasure in our experience. And at the same time, there are disappointments and wounds that are painful to recall. I suspect as we continue on the path of synodality, listening to the experiences of people in our churches, we'll find this more and more. We'll release energy, but we'll also find a mixture of joy and doubt, hope and disappointment. That's why I believe that path, placing the Paschal Mystery at the center of how we understand the liturgy is exactly what we need to do and keep on doing as a precious gift in the legacy of the Council. By acknowledging that we are on the road, like disciples on their way to Emmaus, we are challenged to trust that the risen Jesus will meet us there, remain in our company when we invite him to, and reveal himself in the breaking of the bread. Those disciples who met the risen Jesus and recognized him at their table ran forth from that encounter, eager to tell the others, we have seen the Lord. And this is the template, because the Paschal mystery is not something inert. It is the most wonderful good news, full of the power of God to triumph over everything that binds us. I would like to conclude by quoting the last surviving Italian bishop who participated in Vatican II, Luigi Bettazzi and ask you to join me in prayer. Bishop Petazzi, now 99 years old. How about that, 99 years old. He is also the last surviving participant of the Pact of the Catacombs. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Pact of the Catacombs. It was a passionate manifesto written by a group of bishops at the council, committing themselves to serving the poor and to living simply and humbly according to the spirit rather than as, quote, dominators according to the world. He spoke at an event in Verona in 2021, shortly after Pope Francis reigned in the use of the preconciliar rites. Recalling the Second Vatican Council, Bishop Batazzi said, we are halfway across the ford, but let's remember, we still have to cross. Father Tonio Dell'Olio, a priest journalist and peace activist, pre president of Pro Civitate uh, Cristiana of Assisi, explained, the Ford is the full implementation of the council itself. The council was not the simple production of a certain number of documents, he said, but the inauguration of a style 
made up of listening to the voices that entered the stained glass windows of the church from the street. We are halfway across the ford, but let's remember that we still have to cross it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the courage of those who brought us to the ford of the Second Vatican Council and for the Holy Spirit who led them there and continued to guide them in the days and years that followed. Thank you for the immeasurable grace of allowing us to be part of that journey too, even with all of its challenges and disappointments. Thank you for the leadership of Pope Francis, who has done so much to move the church forward in faith and hope. Guide us through the shallow water as you have guided us through the deep, so that one day we may all at last reach the farther shore. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. So we're going to take a four-minute stretch break, a four-minute warm-up break. And at this time, the you should have received a quarter card where you can write questions. So we'll take this little break. You can write your questions on your cards if you've not already. And I'll invite you to give those to Lisa and to Sister Teresa. And then we'll sit down and dialogue about the things that we have just heard together. The restrooms on the Fulton side are open as well as those in the tower door and we will reconvene together at 44. Okay, I think we're ready. So I'll start things off with a couple of questions for Rita and then Sister Teresa and Lisa will bring your questions to the floor. So thank you so much. It was so fantastic and so wonderful to have you here. Um, the first question that I wanted to start with is, um, in your opening remarks, you elevate us above dichotomies, false dichotomies, which often consume dialogue and academic discourse about the liturgy. And you point us toward a fifth alternative uh, to become good stewards of the legacy we received in the council Speaking in practical terms, what are some ways that worshiping communities can steward this inheritance? Mm. Well, I think there are all kinds of practical ways. And some of the reflections later on in the talk kind of spoke to that. I mean, we can work on renewing our awareness of what the symbols of the liturgy mean and engaging creation through them. I think robust symbols are really important, but also mystagogy on the symbols is important. So catechesis and opportunities to reflect on the liturgy, that's going to help deepen everybody's experience. And I think we could be more intentional about doing those things. Mm. I think we're at a moment in history when Pope Francis's initiatives are now on the table, but we have to decide what to do about them. I mean, if we're going to have instituted ministries and we're going to have this and that, you know, it's, well, what's that going to mean? We, we should have groups discussing that in the parishes and in the diocese to, to get us ready for those expansions and uh, to also broach the topic of the Paschal Mystery as it affects us. Are we really aware of mass as an encounter with the risen Jesus? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think those are questions that we can address a lot of, a lot of different ways. I, I would love to see a Paul VI society in every parish that would be devoted to liturgical renewal and they would be advocates for everything, in m music especially, Enculturation, you know, how can we really involve the cultures of people at a deeper level? Um, things like that. That's helpful. Those are wonderful ideas. Um, you tease out Jesus's earnest desire to share the Passover meal with us 
before illuminating that this desire should also be our own as we encounter the world. In the work of hosting an invitational meal at the Eucharist each week, what are some of the things that the church needs to do well to meet the spiritual hunger of those coming through our doors for the first time? Oh boy, well that's a great question. <laughs> um, I do think hospitality is critical, but you know hospitality isn't just a smile, uh, although I'm, I'm not against smiling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's a, it's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> but a hospitality is also, um, as people are around for a while, really um, inviting them to share their story in one way and another. You know, I noticed uh, uh, some of the participants who are here tonight are, are from an organization called Team RCIA, which has done a lot of work about evangelization and outreach. And uh, they're, one of the things I really appreciate about their approach is that they invite people to believe that the whole parish evangelizes in one way or another. I want to tell a little story, if I may. This is, <laughs> this is something that my uh, colleague Ron Oakham, Father Ron Oakham used to, used to tell, that when he would go around the country giving talks, he would sit in the, the back of churches. He would just come to Mass, whatever was the local church, and he'd sit in the back. And he was at one church, and he was back in the last pew, and they announced the opening hymn. He opened a book and started to sing. Nobody else around him was singing. Mm. And some, a lady down the pew came down and tapped him on the shoulder and said, we don't do that back here. Oh. <laughs> so your community is always, it's always initiating people. They're, they're always either, you know, helping or, you know, stopping people from being part of who they are. You know? and, and so anything that can kind of uh, love people into church, I think, is, is a good thing. And I am particularly concerned about younger people. And I, know, and I don't want to put a guilt trip on anybody, you know, because I know a lot of parents really wish their children were there and they've fallen away. And, you know, it's not anybody's fault. It's, it's a big cultural challenge that we have. But that's where maybe we need to pray for guidance from the Holy Spirit to find the opening. You know, where's the moment? Is it, where's the strategy? I can't tell you what the answers are. I really can't. And I doubt that any of us can, but God knows there are, you know, and, and God will help us to know that if we are willing to and, you know, eager to listen mm -hmm. for the Spirit's voice, I think. Mm. In your exploration of the role of the mystical body of Christ, you explain that when we, the assembly, setter, settle for the role of spectator, we are also giving in to implicit clericalism that affects our way of thinking. Mm. Can you talk more about what some of the responsibilities are for both the worshiping assembly and our priest presiders in combating these clerical attitudes? Mm. Thanks, Maggie. That's a good question, too. Kind of a big one. <laughs> kind of a big one. But um, uh, just a couple of little points, uh, you know, um, and, and I'm sure other people will have their insights as well. Um, but I do, I do think that the way in which uh, priests conduct themselves can be invitational or it can be uh, a bit clerical in the sense of not welcoming or not having a, you know, a sense of, I am the most important person in this room. Even Pope Francis says it in his apostolic letter that a lot of the malfunctions of presiding are, and he lists a bunch of them in a very vivid fashion that we could all probably imagine these things, have to do with this thinly concealed need to be the center of attention. So, um, so for, and I love, I mean, I have a lot of priest friends, and I know a lot of the guys are really, really trying hard. This is not a, a slam on priests at all. But I think that it, this is a good caution. You know, we have to, and, and they have to, be mindful of what Francis calls being small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, make ourselves small sometimes. You're not the main thing that's going on here. 
you're a servant of something that's bigger than, than what you are. So that, and now on the lay side, I, I think uh, there are ways in which we need to strengthen our perception of how our lives are placed on the altar, like I was saying in the talk, mm -hmm. and how our celebrating is actually important. You know, a lot, there have been studies that have been done about people who stop coming to Mass, and they're, one of the things that happens is, at first they don't come as often, and then they realize nobody missed them. Mm -hmm. They realize nobody missed them. And so, you know, if the whole community has a sense that we're all important, every one of us, it, it's not just Father who celebrates, it's all of us that celebrate, you will miss them. Mm -hmm. and, and there are what little ways in which people can convey that, either, you know, uh, uh, just, just uh, implicitly by how they act and also by reaching out, you know, by a word or, a, a, you know, some, some gesture. Very good. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to all of us. And so I don't know if Teresa or Lisa would like to read our first question. This is a question about words. <laughs> okay. Sometimes specific words matter, and perhaps sometimes they are not really the point. Now that we are 10 years past the 2011 English translation, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on the 2011 versus the 90, 1998 translation? And here's just an example. There are problems with the current English translation. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. That is our sacrifice. For the salvation of the many. I thought the salvation of all. Comments, please. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly pitched that one to the right batter. Because <laughs> 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 I've written a lot about this question and I do think there are problems with the 2011 translation and I know we've done our best with it so I would just uh, mention the latest information that I have on that is that the Synod in Australia and New Zealand both came up with a priority was to do another translation to, to redo it mm -hmm. and it's rumored that the American bishops are absolutely opposed so talk to your bishop, <laughs> talk to your bishop. I think some words do matter, you know? <laughs> and, and um, you know, I know may maybe this seems like a, a bit far-fetched, but uh, you know, that I, I, you're all important and your views are important. And if they don't hear from us, who are they going to hear it from, right? Mm. Um, uh, but, I, but I do, who, who was saying prevenient grace? And even the ordained don't know what prevenient grace <laughs> might mean, let alone the person who came to, to, to da daily mass and suddenly hears something about this. And I'm not opposed to theological terminology, but I think the mode in which the translation was made was also trying to replicate Latin syntax. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, I don't think that, I know that, that was, that was the plan. And this is, uh, and always was a mistake, you know. So the question becomes, are we humble enough to correct a mistake? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that's, you know, to make it ultra simple, that is, that is the problem. It's, it's not so much that we couldn't do better. I think we could do better. Oh, the other thing was the Irish wanted to have a, a revision, but the British and the Americans. So I don't know. Anyway, okay, thank you for, it, did I get at something there? Was I okay with that? Okay, next okay. question. Okay, and here's another one. Uh, it's an easy but complex question. 
do you have hope that women will be ordained as deacons or as priests? <laughs> well, you know, uh, Francis is now uh, working on his second committee to study the diaconate for women. And before him, you know, there were two attempts to write, a, you know, about the diaconate for women. And one study was rejected and the next one was ambiguous. And there, there's a, a really interesting grassroots organization called Discerning Deacons. And I, I admire what they're doing. They're, they're trying, they've gathered like thousands of people who are interested in the diaconate for women and are trying to pool their experiences and to say, you know, what has our experience been like? Do we actually want this? Are we actually suited for this? What kinds of things are going on that would help to illuminate and discern the path of the church? So it's nice to see there's some areas of the grassroots, there's some at the higher levels. I think the diaconate for women is, is a much uh, more, uh, you know, uh, possible possibility uh, for the church simply because there's historical evidence for uh, a, a form of, of diaconate for women and also because some of the orthodox churches are reviving the diaconate for women. Uh, the priesthood for women is, is, a, is a much more uh, thorny issue. Uh, certainly there are many gifts that women bring to the ministry um, and the question is you know which of these are how are these appropriately used? I think whatever happens with regard to that, we still are going to be left with the question, uh, two questions. One is the question of our culture. You know, we're in a culture that has women Supreme Court justices, women, you know, uh, in, in charge of, of important corporations, women doing all kinds of things. But then we come to church and women are in a, a, a different role and often a subordinate place. Oh, so that leads to the, the other question, which is how do we balance our leadership capacities with the, the roles we've inherited and how does that have an impact on uh, the, the way in which we view ordination? If we perhaps step back from the question of power with ordination that is not sacramental, but power in general, you know, Maybe we uh, will ask that question in some different ways. And that's what I would hope would, would come about rather than kind of legislating from above that from below we might sort this out a little better than we have in the past. Thank you. So as you can imagine, we have many more questions than we have time to answer. Oh, so okay, yeah. I will try to do a little bit of consolidation because we do definitely have themes. Um, so this is from the chat. What are the most compelling examples of innovation you have seen that engage those in the pews to experience the liturgy through their senses, mm. through movement, the opposite of being an audience? Mm. Mm. So that is, that is one, one question. Mm. And then kind of carrying it along, there are a few others. Mm -hmm. Just a quick answer to yeah. that. Mm -hmm. The catechumenate, hands down, it's the best thing, the best thing ever. It does take us out of ourselves. It gives us this uh, way to use our bodies with the extension of hands, with baptism by immersion, which all of the rites of initiation are tactile. They are bodily incarnations of theology and they involve the community as the active agent of initiation. And I'll just give you a little subset example of that, of churches I've visited, especially in the South and West, but not just there, other places. I've seen some wonderful fonts near the door of the church. We've got a lot of water. And one of the things that always touches me is watching the children, watching the children come up and they reach into the font. They've owned that font, you know, and it's not just a, a small stoop, it's something big. The font is an icon of the church. You climb into it. <laughs> That's one of the things, you know, we, re we recover our symbols by uh, looking at our liturgical tradition and, and using it. Of course, I could speak about other things, but just a quick answer to that mm. question. Thank you. Um, we have another one that 
The liturgy guarantees us the possibility of encountering the risen Christ. What are some things that impact that possibility? What are some obstacles that keep us from that encounter? Oh, very good question. Very good question. Um, I think one of the obstacles is bringing a, um, to the mass a, uh, a notion that we're using this as the one hour in the week that we can be devotional, mm. <laughs> you know? So that we're not really, our mind is not on the action, but on kind of our laundry list of things we're praying for, <laughs> or something that we, you know, oh, well, all week long I have all these problems, but I'm gonna come for one hour and that's gonna solve it, <laughs> you know? No, I mean, I think it has to be a little more depth to it than that. Uh, I think also what can impact it um, is <laughs> how we view our neighbors who are joining in with us. I, uh, another wonderful little story. I was giving a mission at, uh, at a church in San Antonio, Texas. And I asked people, well, the Christ is present in the liturgy. And I did the four ways Christ is present that it says in the Constitution. I said, now, how are we present to one another? And they said all the usual things, you know, greeting each other, sign of peace, holy communion, sharing, and that stuff. And, and one man came up and said, we're present to each other through annoyance. <laughs> 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 he said, I'm always annoyed with other people at mass. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why, why is she dressed like that? And how come he's not singing? <laughs> and he finished very movingly though he finished by saying but by the time communion comes and the same people are coming up to receive the body of Christ he said it all falls away and there is only love and there is only love so I think you know we can have a lot of things that stand in the way the question is in the end is it about love so if we can get to that, even within the celebration of Mass itself, that is a Paschal journey. And I think that's, I'm not sure what time it is, Maggie. Oh, Let's okay. do one more. Okay, great. If so anybody needs also, to leave, we forgive you. And, and those of you who are here will have ample opportunity to ask her other questions at our reception. So we'll take one more question from those on the chat, which is along the lines of kind of what you were just talking about. In your view, what's, what's the opportunity in the upcoming Eucharistic revival, or is there one, for us to learn of Jesus' earnest desire to invite us, our real encounter with the risen Christ, our total offering of selves? Mm. Like, how do you see those related? I would love to see those themes bubble up in our Eucharistic revival. And um, I think uh, at the parish level, we should strive to combine those things however we can, whether it's through special celebrations that highlight those things, whether it's through music that it is going to raise this up, whether it's through talks like this or other um, opportunities for Christian formation that might put that out. I don't want to despise the parish bulletin even, you know. We need to be in dialogue with that beautiful letter on liturgical formation during our journey with the Eucharistic revival. And I say this also because one of the things that motivated the Eucharistic revival was the concern that people don't believe in the real presence as much as they should. Right. Um, and I, there's a danger of seeing the Eucharistic revival as all about adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And I would just caution you to see it in bigger terms because the celebration of the liturgy is what convinces us that Christ is present. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't convince us that Christ is present, no number of Eucharistic miracles that happened to somebody else who saw the host getting bl blood coming from the host or you know whatever other things might be in the grab bag of devotional uh, history that we have around real presence we won't understand that unless we understand he is alive in the Eucharistic celebration so I, I think that celebrating well prepares us to believe in the real presence and if the real presence is something that is always being uh, coming to be 
in our assembly, then the time we spent in adoration and in contemplation before the Blessed Sacrament is full. It's full of meaning. It's, it's full of the stories of people. It's full of our own journeys and our own uh, experiences of the Pascha. So let's try to do that, you know. Let's try to do it from the grassroots. I'm not sure that it's the vision that's going to be necessarily in, in the package, but we can do it. Mm. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. So I invite all of us back uh, for wine and snacks and to continue our conversation. Thank you so much, Rita.